Welcome to Sven's presentation on alternatives to healthcare. We're very fortunate to have two of the most knowledgeable pediatricians in Hawaii who work with our children and teens with disabilities, help educate us on the evidence around the effectiveness of alternatives to traditional healthcare. We are blessed to have Dr. Jeff Okamoto, who's a developmental pediatrician, uh, developmental behavioral pediatrician who sees patients at Kapiolani Center for Women and Children as a Hawaii Pacific Health subspecialist in a clinic at Pale Papa. He loves supporting families and children in the clinic and also teaches the next generation of pediatricians and family practitioners about autism spectrum disorders, learning disabilities, intellectual disabilities, genetic and other conditions. He was a Joseph P. Kennedy Foundation Public Policy Fellow in Washington, D.C., and greatly involved in the American Academy of Pediatrics Council on School Health, especially around the areas of special education and children with special health care needs in schools. Also joining us is the esteemed Dr. Michael Ching, who is a Chief of Developmental Behavioral Pediatrics at Kaiser Permanente in Hawaii. He completed his fellowship at Boston Children's Hospital. Prior to his current position, he worked at Tripler Medical Center. He serves as the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics Hawaii chapter. In his spare time, Dr. Ching loves running, listening to music, and cheering for his favorite sports teams. And who are they, Dr. Ching? Who are your favorite sports teams? Well, I've got a bunch, but I'll just say <laughs> uh, I am a fan of the New York Mets, who uh, just got a new owner. So we're very excited for this coming season. <laughs> All right. Well, now we're going to be begin our uh, presentation today with Dr. Okamoto, and I will let you take the floor, Dr. Okamoto. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, uh, Susan, for the great. Uh, introductions and uh, let's see if I can get to what we need to do here. Is that okay, Susan? Looks good. Great. Okay, so um, it's really interesting to have, uh, you know, two pediatricians talk about this subject about alternatives. You know, we of course try to practice standard uh, medicine, but we also actually have to know quite a bit about alternatives because families are interested in whether or not things work or not and whether or not their children are going to be helped by certain things so we're really actually happy to give this talk and it certainly gives us a chance to update our knowledge about it uh, in addition to what we already had uh, learned previously let's see so our objectives is to discuss non-medical alternative treatments that the parents of children with disabilities are considering using to address the child's symptoms and hopefully after this talk, you'll be more aware of evidence that's regarding the efficacy of certain alternatives. We definitely wanna cover CBD, so uh, Mike's gonna cover that, but I'll cover a neurofeedback and a couple of other things. And then hopefully you'll have some tips on how to evaluate whether an alternative approach is harmful or helpful or, or a waste of money. And then uh, at the end, hopefully you'll know at least one source for more evidence about the effectiveness of commonly used alternative treatments. Okay, so my part is gonna cover um, ADHD at the beginning, and I'll also talk a little bit about cerebral palsy. But um, a lot of kids have ADHD. You know, if you look at the uh, statistics, it's anywhere from five to 10 out of 100 kids have some type of attention deficit hyper hyperactivity disorder. And uh, one of the mainstays of standard treatment is stimulant medication. And a lot of families hear what stimulants, and um, they also may have heard about kids that were on it that had some kind of side effects. And, 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 and this medicine group is pretty safe, but it does you know, have a risk of causing headaches, or dizziness, and particularly reduce appetite. So um, when kids are on this medicine in our clinics, we are actually measuring their growth very carefully to ensure that the medicine is not affecting the growth. And um, 
a lot of people with ADHD, whether or not their child has ADHD or they themselves have ADHD, they seek out alternative therapies often because either the medic medication has stopped working or it never really actually worked to begin with, or it has a lot of side effects or doesn't really actually help the symptoms enough. So here's uh, several things that have been looked at in terms of uh, things that could possibly improve ADHD. So we'll talk about neurofeedback. There's a number of technological aids and we live in a society where you know, we can hopefully use technology to make things better. And then there's a whole field of mindfulness and sort of reflection kind of training. Um, so neurofeedback. So um, that's a kind of a very interesting thing. So the brain emits different kinds of waves. And so, you know, when you have a seizure disorder, those waves are not correct. And, or, you know, it's like um, really taking over your brain. So, you know, we can measure those, right? Like with an EEG. And so uh, people can actually put electrodes on your child or your teenager's uh, head and measure the brain waves. And the goal of neurofeedback is to teach the patient to try to produce brain wave patterns that are associated with focus. So here's a little cartoon. So again, uh, you know, putting these um, leads on the head is, doesn't hurt at all. It's all like sticky, sticky stuff. And uh, the, um, that can be measured. So here's like an example of brain waves. And, and then in um, neurofeedback, a computer actually analyzes the patterns and then can actually give some type of feedback to the person. So if the waves are uh, you know, good waves for focus, then the computer can give um, you know, some kind of signal, whether or not it be a cartoon or you know, some type of colors, whatever. Uh, that's what the computer program is all about. And it can actually really kind of map out like the different parts of your brain and what kind of waves are in different parts. And so in neurofeedback, the um, people who are doing that with your child or teenager is trying to figure out, um, you know, sort of when does the child or teenager have the right waves and in the program giving feedback to that person. And so like here's a photograph. So you can see these uh, leads coming off of the um, sensors that uh, is on the person's head. And then here's the monitor and this person's watching it. And uh, you can make it into a game. So that's really great for kids, right? So they can uh, feel like they're part of a game, but you know, a lot of it is just having them do the right thing. Uh, with focusing to have the right feedback from the computer. So there's all kinds of studies and this is not meant to be read. So I, I kind of wanted to highlight that initially there was really a lack of evidence for neurofeedback as well as a lot of other things for ADHD. And um, so initially there's a lot of studies and a lot of hope and then it's like, wow, not so much evidence, but actually more recently, and of course the studies get better and better over time, seems to show that um, can be a pretty good treatment actually. It has what they call large effect sizes. So it really does uh, do what we're thinking it's going to do to, in a good way, in a, in, a, in a pretty powerful way. And uh, it actually has sustained effects after six to 12 months. So the psychologists and other people that are doing neurofeedback really um, are feeling like it's actually a pretty good technique. And that's something that you know, your family can actually look at to see if it would be right for your child. Tricky part is the cost of it. So um, neurofeedback can cost anywhere between like $4,000 to $6,000 after you have lots of treatment sessions. And um, so one study actually compared, well, how much would medication cost and um, with your insurance plan already, you know, um, it would 
probably be about $3,500 to $7,000 for five to 10 years worth of medicine. And again, you know, once you finish these treatments, you're hoping that the effects will be sustained. So some people would argue that um, this is kind of worth it, even though there's like a big amount, you know, initially that, you know, if it works, um, it can be worthwhile. Okay, so there's a number of technological aids. And so technology has obviously progressed. So I don't think a lot of people even know what a pager is now, but certainly everybody's on mobile phones. And um, so initially when we had old technology, there was this system that was developed by actually a father of a young man that uh, suffered a brain injury. And then the young man's neuropsychologist, they got together and they said, hey, I wonder if we send this uh, young man messages through this pager, would that help him, you know, in terms of reminding him to do things and uh, getting him kind of organized. And in ADHD, uh, people just, you know, have a lot of problems with staying organized and staying on task. And uh, this actually had quite a bit of research, so that was nice. But of course, the technology has advanced, and now there's smartphones, and you can have certain apps. There's lots of apps, so if you kind of look up ADHD and you know apps, wow, you'll 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 find a lot of stuff. You know, it's great for teenager and that they love doing stuff on the smartphone. Yeah, but you know evidence not that great so here's uh, uh looking at executive functioning so organizational skills and attentional skills with uh, teenagers with traumatic brain injury and uh, it's pretty modest effect you know so if you're really hopeful that's going to take care of the whole problem maybe not and here's a nice paper about adhd mobile apps and they systematically reviewed a whole bunch of apps. And the conclusion is very few apps contain information regarding their development, and none contain information regarding efficacy, uh, effectiveness. So we just don't know if they work. You know, there's a lot of them out there, but whether or not they work, I think that's still uh, up in the air. So, um, Another way of kind of using technology are mindfulness apps, and there's lots of those also, and you can do um, training of your child for mindfulness. So um, you're really trying to get them to calm down, be aware of moment to moment experience, and then sustain attention that way. And uh, reflection training is like kids reflecting on how they are doing, and getting an autopilot where they're just impulsively doing stuff and getting them to really be thoughtful and acting deliberately. And so there's a number of apps. Um, here's some, I'm not really, um, you know, sort of um, getting any money from any of these places, but um, there's a lot of websites about all these different apps. Um, and, um, just gonna give you a couple of examples. So there's these ones where there's these mindfulness scripts and um, basically the parents can use these scripts to lead their children through some mindfulness training. So there's like breathing buddies, mindful eating, Spider-Man meditation. So I'll show you some examples. So this is like the breathing buddies a photo. And you can see they're all concentrating on these like stuffed animals. They're on their back and they're concentrating on the stuffed animal, trying to relax, be thoughtful about the moment. And this is like the script. So you ask your child to lie comfortably and if they use a stuffed animal, they can hold it in the top of their belly. And then you want them to inhale deeply through the nose and then um, Try to get their belly to come big and then exhale to a slow count of four. And you know, this is just like meditation for adults, right? But you're trying to teach kids um, how to do that. And then there's like mindful eating. So uh, here's like sort of tips for 
um, mindful eating. So most of us just like, we just like whatever we feel a certain way, we're gonna eat or whatever. And, um, you know, thinking about eating and uh, actually doing it very deliberately and in health. And then here's one that's a Spider-Man script, which is to activate their superpowers. So that's why this is appealing to kids, right? We're talking about superheroes, okay? And when they're uh, seated and they close their eyes, you can ring a bell and you want to pay attention to the ring until you can no longer hear the ringing sound. And then they can activate the um, superpowers of seeing touching and smelling. So you can use like a flower and you hold the flower gently and you touch the petals and you know, wow, just Dr. Okamoto reading this makes me feel much more peaceful, you know? So yeah, so you can kind of use this script with your child. So there's lots of websites, gonoodle.com, tom.com are some resources. And there's um, this website called Beyond Book Smart. So if you're interested, there's lots of materials out there about mindfulness. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears. So that was all about kind of more looking at ADHD and executive functioning, organizational skills, paying attention. This is a serious condition, uh, cerebral palsy. A uh, number of kids with prematurity have this, but also other kids that have maybe a stroke when they were born. And it's uh, affecting motor function. And um, if it affects the spinal cord, then it's really not CP, or if it's like a brachial plexus injury where they're just injured some parts of the nerves, that's not CP. And cerebral palsy, it's really a brain condition. And some of it is because of bleeding into the brain or part of the brain that didn't have enough blood or oxygen, and then there's um, damage. Okay, and then this is like a cartoon, different patterns of cerebral palsy, and some kids have both arms and legs affected, but a lot of kids are premature, they have more legs than arms. And we put braces on kids with CP, and so there's standard treatments, there's medicine that we can use. Uh, here's one about uh, medication. But uh, so there's this article, it's a really terrific article because it's looking at all the different kinds of therapies for cerebral palsy. And uh, this is just to give you like a big overview. I'll kind of get these uh, bigger for you just in a second. But in these green um, circles, it's really a lot of good research and not a lot of you know, problems and side effects. And these yellow ones are, you know, you can probably do it. Mm, some evidence, pretty good evidence. These underneath this line, this line is called the worth it line in this uh, paper. And it's like um, underneath that line, probably not worth it, especially these red circles. So we'll look at that. And then what the size of the circle is about is how many research studies were done for that particular technique. And in this paper, what's really neat is that they covered not just sort of some standard therapy that we all think about like physical therapy, but it uh, covers other things too, like strength training. But this one here is very interesting. It's called hippo therapy. And uh, at first glance, you might think, oh, oh, what are you supposed to do with like the hippo? But actually hippo is like the word for horse in uh, Latin, and it's actually having therapeutic kind of uh, horse therapy. And you're on top of the horse, and hopefully you can actually um, have better motor coordination and strength from being on the horse. So this is actually a real thing, and people have done research on it. Uh, initially, it was done in Europe, and it was only recognized in the United States in like the 1980s, but it's caught on quite a bit. And there's you know, a number of people in Hawaii that are doing hippotherapy. And there's actually really terrific evidence behind it. So even though some people might say, what? That doesn't sound like that's gonna do anything. It actually has uh, lots of information and uh, people who do um, that kind of horse hippotherapy, horse therapy, they uh, can get uh, 
reimbursed through insurance sometimes because the insurance is looking to see whether or not there's information about it. So here's a lot of um, sort of, yeah, probably do it. Here's acupuncture, lots of research behind that one, particularly for cerebral palsy. And then these ones that are uh, not, not so worth it. And uh, hyperbaric oxygen, who that was very popular for a while. You're kind of in like a pressure chamber and then they put oxygen in that and very popular at one point for autism, also for um, cerebral palsy, they thought about it for because there was some evidence that it helped people with traumatic brain injury. But you can see that unfortunately that and sensory integration for motor skills, sensory integration used a lot for kids with autism, but for cerebral palsy, it's down in the red zone here. Okay, so if you wanna look up complementary things. There's a um, National Institute of Health, uh, NIH, has actually a whole center for complementary and integrative health. And uh, it's a very parent and um, sort of person-friendly website, and they basically are looking at the research and things, and, you know, some things become really um, highly touted because there's lots of information. And some of that will end up being standard therapy, you know, so it won't even be complementary uh, or alter uh, alternative therapy later on. Okay, so that's a website that uh, could be helpful to you. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Chang now and he'll talk more about autism, CBD, and some other things. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, um, so, um, many, many therapies approaches out there, right? And so today, uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to go over some therapies, including CBD, as Jeff mentioned. And after today's talk, I hope you'll take away a general approach for learning if a therapy is for you or for your family member. Uh, again, we have no financial relationships to dis disclose. And I will be discussing the off-label use of medications in this talk. Uh, and basically everywhere that you see an FDA approved medication, we'll be talking about it in an off-label way. Uh, so as Jeff discussed, you know, complementary and alternative medicine is a hot topic and it has been for a long time. We define it as healthcare approaches that are not typically part of conventional medical care or that may have origins outside of the usual Western practice. Uh, CAM encompasses many diverse practices and that includes mind and body interventions like meditation and yoga, biologically based therapies like vitamins and diet, manipulative and body-based practices like massage and manipulation, energy therapies like Reiki and Qigong, and whole alternative medical systems like Ayurvedic and traditional Chinese medicine. CAM is also used in, uh, CAM used in autism also includes conventional Western medical therapies that are used in alternative ways. And these include pharmaceuticals like antifungals and secretin and non-pharmaceuticals such as the hyperbaric oxygen that Jeff mentioned. I won't get a chance to talk about all the different things that are used in CAM, CAM treatment of autism or other uh, conditions, um, but I'll have a bunch of more, a bunch of slides that I don't get a chance to cover just because of timing. And you can take a look at these slides on the SPIN website after this talk. So how common is CAM in autism? It's very common. Estimates range from 39 to 95%. Uh, using these therapies. And the most commonly used form are the biologically based therapies, which are used in over half of children with autism. This includes things like a modified diet, vitamin therapies, mind-body therapies, manipulation-based therapies are also becoming common, and energy therapies, somewhat less common. Okay, so now that we've talked about what CAM is, how commonly used those techniques are, and why parents choose to incorporate them, I'm going to turn to some of the actual evidence behind some of those therapies. But to do that, I wanted to first present this model that I use when I'm looking at uh, therapy. So along the um, axis here, along this uh, x-axis here, y-axis here, we talk about safe 
or unsafe their uh, knowledge of the condition, uh, the therapy, excuse me. And along this side, we have evidence for efficacy or conflicting or no evidence. And so for example, when a therapy is safe and we do have evidence for efficacy, we're gonna encourage its use where it's clinically indicated. Now, if something is safe, but there's conflicting or no evidence, in those cases, a physician would ask, would typically tolerate the use and encourage objective monitoring to know that you're getting out of the therapy what you intended uh, to receive. When a therapy is unsafe, or the safety is unknown more likely, but there is some evidence for efficacy, we would suggest that you monitor closely its use or discourage the use, especially if it's unsafe. And if it's something that's unsafe or the safety is unknown and there's conflicting or no evidence, and this is the uh, most of the situations that we find ourselves in, we typically would tend to discourage its use. Um, so that's a, that's a model that I use with my patients to talk about CAM therapy um, and uh, we'll use that model as we go forward in this talk. So now let's go through a few examples of CAM therapies. So the first example of this would be melatonin. As you know, melatonin is a hormone from the brain. It's secreted by the pineal gland in the brain, um, located deep inside the brain over here. And it helps to regulate your circadian rhythms, which are uh, the internal clock for sleep. We know that children with autism spectrum disorders and other developmental conditions have abnormal sleep architecture and several small randomized controlled trials have shown the efficacy of melatonin. So for example, um, melatonin has been shown to increase sleep onset latency by about 47 minutes. So that's the time that it takes a child to fall asleep at bedtime. So 47 minutes faster. And it also, has been shown on average to increase the total night's sleep by 52 minutes. So it doesn't seem to make you sleep that much longer, but you know, if you're a parent whose kid is stirring around and you, know, you want the kid to go to sleep, it might be something that you might look into. Melatonin has mild side effects, including nocturnal enuresis, which is bedwetting, and morning somnolence, which is um, being sleepy in the morning when you wake up. Uh, it's considered to be safe, it, up to seven and a half milligrams for prolonged use in both short and extended release forms. And again, this is an off-label discussion of medication use. And the bottom line is that melatonin is safe and effective, and we would encourage its use where it's indicated by the symptoms. The one caveat here is that most children with developmental issues, including autism, also benefit from conventional behavioral recommendations around sleep hygiene. So don't forget, that we would also be talking to you about those issues. Vitamin C. So no recent studies have been done investigating vitamin C as a supplement for autism, but there has been some theory behind this based on this suggestion that vitamin C might affect dopamine receptors. And almost 20, 30 years ago, there was one study, a double blind randomized control trial with only 18 children. And they said that in that situation, in that case, uh, in that study, there was decreased stereo stereotypy. So hand flapping or the self-stimulatory movements. That being said though, children with autism can have extremely restricted diets. So there is a New England Journal of Medicine clinical case record of a nine-year-old boy with autism who developed scurvy. And this child for the past month or two had consumed only toaster pastries or Pop-Tarts and cola drinks, none of which contain vitamin C. So rather than um, specifically supplementing with vitamin C, if you have a child who's really picky about their eating, I would consider a multivitamin, especially um, one that consists, con contains vitamin C if the, if the story that um, can suggests that there might be a vitamin C uh, deficiency in what the child is taking in. So ultimately vitamin C is safe. It has really not proven benefit for kids uh, except in certain situations. And I would suggest that we uh, tolerate, monitor its use. Uh, speaking of multivitamins, there have also been case reports of vitamin deficiency, including vitamins A and vitamin D. And this is because again, some children can be very picky when it comes to food. And here's another case report that was reported in the literature 
of a child with vitamin A deficiency who ultimately required corneal grafting. So the surface layer of the eye became uh, uh, ulcer and they had to get a transplant of a cornea to, into this child. And what happened was, <clears throat> the story was the child was a picky eater who would only eat bacon and an occasional blueberry muffin and would drink only Kool-Aid. And so this child eventually required um, intramuscular, intravenous vitamin A therapy. So injection of vitamin A because he refused to take the oral multivitamin. I would note that vitamins are generally regarded as safe, but toxicity can happen when you're combining multiple, multiple vitamins. Um, parents can find the maximum daily recommended dose for vitamins at the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health website. Um, you can go to this link here. And the bottom line is that multivitamins are safe. Um, again, they have unknown efficacy on the core symptoms of developmental issues, except under unusual circumstances. And you know, we generally say uh, we would tolerate the use and monitor, make sure um, that there's no uh, side effects from that. Okay, uh, the gluten and casein-free diet, that's the most common therapy, I think, that people with autism will try for their children. Um, and the use of this diet comes from this so-called opioid hypothesis, that is uh, incomplete breakdown of gluten and casein, some proteins in food, can lead to opioid-like or narcotic-like proteins or peptides that cross the blood-brain barrier and can affect uh, receptors in the brain. Um, the study is really looking at whether people with developmental disabilities are more likely to have guts that are permeable to these proteins, not super conclusive. Um, that being said though, many studies have been done looking at the gluten and casein free diet, um, but it's really hard to do a, a study on this because it, you know, kids are very picky. They may only eat a specific brand of macaroni and cheese. And when you present them with the non-gluten and non-casein containing macaroni and cheese, they're going to like refuse. So it's really hard. They're going to know the difference, right? So it's really hard to, um, you know, to study this in a controlled manner, uh, especially when kids are very picky. So there's not a lot of great evidence. That being said, um, well, it is also difficult to implement before those reasons because kids will know the difference. And it's very expensive, right? When you're buying food from the health food store uh, compared to buying it from your regular grocery store. And there may be possible medical um, issues too. Um, the main source of casein in the diet is dairy foods. And so there has been some concern about when you cut out casein and you cut out the dairy foods and you're not getting enough calcium and you may have decreased bone mineral density. Um, so this study here that I cited, they looked at children with autism who were on the gluten and casein free diet and they found almost a 20% decrease in bone thickness um, or bone density compared to um, other kids. Whether that's clinically significant, you know, whether your kids are going to have more fractures, it's unknown. But ultimately, even with that said, I, I think the diet is, is probably safe, um, although we don't know if it is of huge benefit. And I would say, you know, it, you can try it, but I would make sure that you want to see, is it doing what you wanted it to do uh, in terms of, you know, symptoms of the condition. Okay. This is the big one here, cannabidiol. Um, so CBD, um, cannabidiol is one of uh, the different cannabinoids that are out there. Um, they come in different forms. Endocannabinoids are the ones that our brain naturally makes on its own. Um, synthetic cannabinoids are made in the laboratory and phytocannabinoids are extracted from, well, marijuana. So, mm -hmm. Um, and these come as different pharmaceutical grade and as well as uh, supplement grade um, cannabinoids. So Epidiolex is a oral spray that is used for children who have uh, Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, a uh, very severe type of uh, epilepsy, um, Sativex oral spray, and then, like I said, the commercial products. So cannabidiol works by suppressing 
neurotransmitter release in the brain. And this can have effects on appetite, pain, cognition or thinking, neuroexcitability, reward systems, and thermal regulation, like regulating your temperature. There is substantial evidence that cannabinoids do have a benefit in adults for specific indications. Adults with chronic pain have been shown to benefit from the use of cannabis. Uh, cannab cannabidiol also seems to help with nausea and vomiting in chemotherapy and in spasticity in people with multiple sclerosis. There is moderate evidence for the treatment of sleep outcomes in sleep apnea patients, fibromyalgia, chronic pain, and multiple sclerosis. And this is again, all in adults. That being said, is it legal? Well, the FDA actually considers CBD to be a drug as uh, any other uh, medication might be. So it is their uh, perspective that is, it is illegal to market CBD as a dietary supplement, just as if you were to, uh, to market you know, any other medication as a dietary supplement. Um, and FDA is beginning to, to enforce health claims uh, so if someone makes a claim that it's going to do something for your health, it's beginning to enforce things. And these, these two links uh, are references to that. It is unclear how legal CBD will even be in states with legalized recreational marijuana. So even though marijuana might be legal, it's not clear that CBD would be legal in those states. Um, if you have any questions about that, I uh, encourage you to seek legal advice. So CBD comes in various forms, edibles. So like things like cookies, brownies, lollipops, gummy bears, comes as topicals, creams, ointments, tinctures. That's the most common one you'll see. Those are like the uh, medicine bottles with the dropper inside. Um, you can get CBD by vaping uh, liquids. And you can also have CBD via dabbing, which is when you get a uh, resin, like a, a solid, and you heat that up and inhale that. Edibles are hard to accurately dose because you don't know how much is in the edible. Um, again, tinctures are the most common. That's the sprays or the drops, and they have more reliable dosing. Uh, if a family is interested in using CBD, uh, we recommend that you ask some questions of the person who's selling you the CBD. So for example, how do the sourcing companies test for reliability? How do you know how much is in what you're buying, right? How do they test for con contaminants? Uh, you can ask if you can have the phone number to call the company that's making it. Uh, and one useful site that does a lot of this homework is this consumerlab.com. It is a subscription site but if you're spending a lot of money potentially on CBD, it might be worthwhile knowing that what you're getting uh, is what you think you're getting. Um, some may be 80% of what's marketed, some may be less. Uh, you should, certainly wouldn't want to know that it's more than you think you're getting. There are um, some potential side effects for CBD. Um, you can have liver toxicity. Uh, they may interact with other medicine to either increase or decrease the effects. Um, and in laboratory uh, models, CBD has been shown to have some effects on hormones, including testicular size, sperm growth, and testosterone. So in conclusion about CBD, I would say that CBD has unknown safety, unknown efficacy, and I'd recommend um, if you're gonna use it, we would wanna make sure that you monitor for any benefits or side effects as well. So I, I know uh, our, our talk can go on and on and on about many different subjects, but in general, um, making CAM choices kind of relies on uh, the families to um, discuss that with people who may have other experiences with it, may have knowledge, ability to get them the knowledge if they are trying to look things up. And that might be talking to your doctor. 
Um, as a physician, my approach is that, you know, CAM is a personal decision for families. Um, I try to be non-judgmental about it. And I'm try I try to facilitate a discussion about the evidence and risks, right? So we wanna talk about what do we know about the benefit? What are the potential side effects? I always encourage my families to objectively monitor what's happening. So meaning how many times is the child having a tantrum in a given week? Or how many times is the child, you know, um, flapping their hands? Or how long does it take the child to fall asleep? Um, objective monitoring helps you to know if you're um, basically getting your money's worth out of what you're spending on it. So, and, and we always try to think about, you know, time and effort for any uh, CAM choice and the finances. Dr. Okamoto already showed you this uh, National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, and I highly recommend that you go check out their website. They have a lot of information on there. If you have more questions about anything that we talked about or other, um, uh, other things, this is where you can find the vitamin uh, information. So in summary for my talk, again, there are many different evidence-based treatments for developmental issues, including behavioral and medical treatments, but integrative health treatments can have a role. Of evidence is, almost, is often limited. And I really wanna empower your, you families to speak with your healthcare provider about integrative health. When you go to the SPIN website, you'll see uh, more slides like on chelation, uh, antifungal agents, probiotics, uh, omega and so on, hyperbaric oxygen. So there's a whole bunch of things. I have about 50 slides on here. Um, so uh, again, thank you. Thank you for the attention and listening to our talk. And um, I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much for that, that wonderful presentation, uh, both of you. Do you have a minute or two to answer a few questions? Of course. Great. Um, Dr. Okamoto, you were talking about melatonin, and we have a parent that asked, do you recommend melatonin for children under the age of three? Uh, that was uh, Dr. Ching, so I think he'll take Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, Dr. Ching. You know, usually in, in kids that age, um, we always try to do um, behavioral strategies first. A lot of times kids are sleeping at um, in disorganized stretches, sometimes during the day, sometimes late at night, waking up random times, sleeping at random times. Uh, the, the mainstay for taking care or trying to figure out what is going to be helpful for a child is talking to your um, pediatrician or um, family practice doctor about, you know, what's going on with the sleep. Um, melatonin, like I said, is generally safe. But if you don't have to take it because there are some other things that you might do, uh, that's probably better. Thank you. And Dr. Okamoto, how long should I try some of these alternative treatments to see if they'll work for my child? That's going to depend, of course, whether or not your child's going through any side effects. So if there's lots of side effects, you want to probably uh, be careful about it might want to even stop it and then talk more with, you know, someone including your healthcare professional. But, um, you know, um, I think Dr. Ching actually mentioned that what we want to do is uh, look at what is the outcome you're trying to get. So if there's, you know, a particular symptom that you want going away, uh, you want them to have decreased aggression, or if you want them to pay attention better, you know, you're actually um, monitoring that, right, in particular. And, uh, you know, if it seems to um, show some effect, you can give that uh, a continued trial. Sometimes you need to actually um, adjust things for it to work as uh, good as possible. But, you know, it sort of depends on what you're looking at and then whether or not there's any side effects. Because side effects will probably make you stop or at least, you know, think twice about continuing to use it. Thank you. Now, I know that you both uh, are queried by families that come into the clinic about uh, CBD oil as well as medical marijuana. And 
one of our listeners asks, do you help children with medical marijuana cards? I can go first, Jeff. I don't, I don't uh, do medical marijuana cards. Yeah, neither do I. And um, the legislators also are very interested, right? So they're uh, in Hawaii, they're looking to see what are the conditions that um, are helped by that. And, you know, Dr. Ching actually mentioned a number of them. So uh, certain kinds of epilepsy and seizure disorder, right? But um, whenever they come to ask us, you know, about um, like autism, um, you know, the evidence is not uh, there yet. And so um, normally, you know, I think Dr. Ching and I might consider um, doing the medical marijuana if there's lots of evidence and, you know, our families are gonna have a benefit from that. But at this point, there's, there doesn't seem to be the evidence there. And there's definitely some worries about it causing harm in kids. So um, speaking of harm, um, what would be warning signs that families should look for if they are using CBD oil with their children? That's a great question. I mean, I think families typically know best, right? If there's something off, right? If there's irritability, um, lethargy, right? The kids seem something wrong with them. Certainly if, the, if they're taking different medicines, if there's some side effects of those medicines that you didn't notice before, but you had been warned about, like appetite issues or sleep problems, um, you know, certainly the stomach issues are a big one, I think. Um, I mean, usually we don't see too many side effects um, with CBD, um, but I've had patients come to me and tell me all kinds of random things that have caused them to stop using CBD. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's out there. I think as a, as a mom or a dad or a caregiver, if you see anything that you have a question about, um, I would urge you to contact your uh, healthcare professional. Um, Mike, you know, do you, what do you think about um, some new effect, whether or not it's a good effect or a bad effect, and then the, having them then stop it and seeing, you know, what happens, and then starting again, you know, they can kind of do a trial with their own child, right, on, then off, then on. Do you think that might be helpful for some of our families? And yeah, there's, there's some of this research around these, they call them end of one trials, right, where you just have the one child and you're trying on and off. Um, certainly, I think we tend to compare before and after, right, before the medicine and, or treatment and after the treatment, but not too often do we say, okay, let's stop it again and then see if the benefit goes away or, or if the side effect goes away. Um, I mean, certainly, I think if there is a side effect that, that we would probably recommend stopping it, seeing if it goes away. But um, yeah, I think, you know, if you, if that's something that uh, you're interested in, I think a lot of your, um, again, like your healthcare provider can help you um, kind of sort through whether the benefit or things are coincidence or, or wishful thinking or uh, placebo effect, or it's actually something there. Thank you. Uh, and this one's for you, Dr. Okamoto. Is there any research to support aqua therapy in regards to cerebral palsy? Um, actually, the rehab units were always uh, big into aqua therapy. So I'm not actually sure if that is considered alternative and complementary because we were already doing them in uh, many rehab units. Uh, I haven't looked at the latest evidence on that, but I think since you know a number of uh, units across the United States are using aqua therapy, it probably has some kind of benefit, but I just don't know the evidence on that. So that's something that would be great to research and you know look, look at the evidence. And a final question for either one of you is, what role does exercise play uh, when using an alternative healthcare treatment? I know that's pretty broad, but do you have any ideas? Would it help, would exercise exacerbate effects or would it complement? Yeah, I, I mean, I think for, I, I can say that as a person who exercises myself, I feel like, you know, there's huge behavioral, uh, emotional, 
um, probably health benefits as well um, to exercise, um, whether you know it accelerates or hinders the effect of a therapy. I mean, I guess it would probably depend on the therapy. Most of the time, I would guess that it would not would not do something different, right? Like if you were taking um, you know melatonin and doing exercise, I don't think you, your benefit would be too much different. Um, I think a lot of families, they try to run the kids to exhaustion, uh, especially these kids with ADHD. And I find that that none of them uh, tell me that uh, that actually makes their kids less hyper and go to sleep sooner. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think exercise is an important part of just an overall healthy lifestyle. Uh, Jeff, you have any thoughts on that? You know, I think, Susan, you're bringing up maybe an interesting point in that some of my families are trying three different things all at once, right? Including maybe exercise as one of the things that they're trying. And um, so say exercise is actually helping their child, but like, how do you know, right? Because you got these three things. So then you might say, oh, you know, it's this uh, CBD that's actually doing it, right? So I think families should be... Um, smart and you know take things more deliberately right so in, in some ways almost like a little bit of a research experiment because you want to know okay is that one thing that you're trying working and when you try to do three uh, things all at one time uh, whatever the side effect or the you know good effect you know how do you know which one so then you're going to have to go back to trying each of them anyway so you might as well deliberately uh, do that I think that's actually one of the problems with diets, yeah, because uh, diets, you know, it's so dependent on so many variables. So we're not your child on it, off it. And, you know, it's, uh, I think that's a really hard thing sometimes to measure. Yeah, whether or not, okay, it's the diet or not, or, you know, you just happen, ha happen to have a good day or, uh, or whatever. But, but so I think that's bringing up a good point is that when our families try a number of things, because, you know, when you go on the web, you might find 10 things, right? And then you just feel like, hey, let's do all 10 of them, right? And, um, you, know, I, you know, how do you know what, what, what's going on with that, you know? Well, Spin wants to thank you so much. Um, our families are, as you just mentioned, are sometimes so desperate to find supports for their children that they'll try anything. And now that they've got some good solid evidence about various treatments and they know a process of decision-making, uh, that's gonna make it so much better. And we appreciate your time and your generosity that you're always willing to give to Spin. So, mahalo. Thanks, Thanks Spin. I appreciate everything you guys are doing. <laughs>